Michael Yao and Adi for doing yeah. <laughs> Not this? Both? I think it's okay like that. <coughs> Hopefully, I will not be too long. No? <laughs> You're here for you, and not here for me. No, you can <laughs> Of course not. Oh my You're God! We're all here to hear you. No. Very, That's very sweet. happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Do you come there often? Yeah, we, we yeah. have a place here. We're here every three weeks, four weeks. Two oh, weeks. oh, really? Yeah. I knew that you had a place here because you yes. said it in one conference that I saw. But I didn't know that you would yeah, come. Uh, oh, that's so here. nice. Because, but we're in Miami Beach. This time we stayed in Bell Harbor. Bell Harbor. So nice you stayed in Blue Diamonds or something like that? Our, my Diamond. apartment is in the Green Diamond. That's nice. The Shabbat Rati Altair. That's really very nice. Community. It's a very nice community. Yeah. It's so beautiful. We ate at Kosh last night. Ah, that's great. I didn't eat today, but Rosh I have to zip my mouth. My husband. Ah, uh, yes. We brought challahs and I made some little uh, kikush and little malava, uh, so that's the for myself. Very basic. <laughs> my husband went to Shul and had a big feast. That's and then we're nice. going to go out to Rastakov for this yeah, special session. Thank That's you. Nice. Thank you, Isaac. Put my pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Everybody was so excited. I know that a lot of people didn't come because of, there's a lot of traffic. They're doing some kind of like fair over here. That's really Such not... Such balagan. It's a balagan and I don't... They have a lot of space. They have parks and everywhere in, in the center of the island. They don't need to do it in the yeah, middle. It's crazy. I know even us. Together we ordered Uber Eats yesterday. I it never took an hour and a half for our food to come from ten minutes away. I know it's crazy. A friend of mine, we were we were having dinner yesterday, uh, Shabbat, at her house, and uh, she, her Insta card never arrived, and she ordered it like for it was supposed to be, uh, to be there around three, it never arrived. She said, "I'm sorry, I don't have any drinks." <laughs> it's okay. I know we, we all understand when it's traffic. Don't expect definitely, it, you know? definitely. I'm sorry that I'm gonna give you my back. It's Roses okay. don't have a front or a back. No. That's what they say in our culture. Well, fashion. Flower doesn't have a front or a back. Tom. So now what? So now like... Oh, it's not my stove. It's not my stove. It's not my stove. It's not my stove. How much can I say? I'm going to try to... Thank you. I don't know if I can. Is it sticking on? You might help. I'm gonna do it like that. Yeah, I'm just afraid that it's gonna be. Um, it's gonna be like that. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it's gonna be. Um, <coughs> Shavuata, can you hear me? Yeah. I think maybe we have to turn it on a little bit more. Let me check. Ah ouais, non, attends. Good evening. Is it working better now? No. no. Okay. Can you hear me though? No. Something wrong with the speaker. Maybe it's just off. That's it. Hold on. No, it seems to work. Hello, hello. Now you hear me better? No. Okay. No. You do? Is it better if I just speak like that? Yes. Should I? Yes. Yeah? It's okay for you? Yes. Yeah. Let's go. It's even easier with my hands because uh, Sephardic women, we are used to speaking with the hands. So if you give me like only one hand to speak, it's going to be weird. So good evening, Shavua Tov, and welcome uh, to this beautiful evening. Thank you so much to Mr. and Mrs. Dagmi, to our dear Adina for organizing this beautiful uh, gathering of women. It's so special. And thank you so much to Sharina Amina for coming and inspiring us tonight. Um, the shul.com is a wonderful new organization and uh, we are very excited to have uh, this beautiful uh, conference tonight recorded for that website. 
So I want to ask you a question. First of all, my name is Esther Sidbon. I live here in Miami. Thank you, Adina, for your trust. Um, I want to ask you a question. <laughs> Do you, have you ever been to Yosemite Park? Yes. yes. Do you know that over there in Yosemite Park, they have trees, sequoia trees, that are more than 3,000 years old? It's amazing when you think about it. It means that we are in 5783. 3,000 years old, uh, ago, in 2448, the Ivrim were getting out of Egypt. They were becoming, they were going to reach their potential of becoming Am Israel. And at the same time, when we were getting out of Egypt, the Yamsuf was opening for us to become this potential amazing great nation a little seed was planted in California. I don't know by whom, but it was planted in California. And today, when you see a sequoia tree that is 3,000 years old, it's huge, it's immense, it's splendid. It's, everything was contained in that little seed that was planted 3,000 years ago. All the DNA, all the leaves, all the fruits, all the flowers that this tree ever uh, created, that bloomed and that fall, fell, you know, <laughs> was actually contained in one little tiny seed. We are all amazed today that we have cell phones that can do so many things, that there's those nano chips that are so small and yet contain so much data. When we observe the creation of Akadosh Baruch Hu, we are not that amazed, but it is amazing when you think about it. Tomorrow, at that time, I know that all of us will be eating fruits. Not because we're trying to lose those extra pounds from uh, the souvenirs of Hanukkah, even though we're still trying to do that, okay? But because it will be to Bishvat. When you think about it, we are in winter, in the month of Shvat, and yet we are celebrating the rebirth, the Rosh Hashanah of the trees, by eating fruits. Okay, we are in Miami, where the trees don't uh, lose their, their uh, leaves, but in the rest of the universe, and I, I bet in, in Brooklyn, usually the trees lose their leaves and they look totally bald. They almost look dead. And this is the time that we choose to celebrate the Rosh Hashanah of the trees by eating fruits. Why? I see no fruits, I see no flowers during Tu Bishvat. Indeed, Tu Bishvat is not the day where the fruits are, are ripe or the flowers blossom. Not at all. The Torah teaches us that Tu Bishvat is the day when the sap goes up inside of the tree for the first time again this year. And it's so amazing because this is something that nobody can tell. If you see a dead tree, a sleeping tree, let's say, a bald tree under the snow, covered with the snow, and it is the day of Tu Bishvat, how can you imagine that inside of its trunk, life is actually coming back? That a rebirth is preparing. This is so beautiful. The fruits will show up in the summer, and therefore they are the consequence of that rebirth. On Tu Bishvat, we are actually celebrating our ability to have bitachon in Hashem, to have trust in Hashem, that even though in our lives, sometimes everything seems sleeping, everything seems dead, everything seems with no outlet. And it happens to many of us that we feel Discourage, nothing good is going to happen to me. And yet, without us knowing that day of Tu Bishvat, we can actually plant the seed 
of a future rebirth, of something that is going to happen, and Hashem is preparing it today already. So that day of Tu Bishvat, if we eat the fruits, is because we show Hashem, you know what? I am in a situation where it's very difficult, but I trust you. I know that there was something sweet coming up, and I trust you. I have bitachon in you. You probably know this, word, this sentence from Rabbi Nachman Mibretzlev that says, the day you were born is the day HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided that this world cannot function without you. This is the day you were born. The day you were born and your mother, God bless all, your, all our mothers, gave birth to you. This is the day where Hashem planted a seed in this world. A seed with so much potential. A little baby comes alive with so much potential. What is this potential? It is the mission that he has planted inside of that baby, uniquely for that baby. Because only that baby, only you, only me, only Charlene, only each and every one person, we only have a unique mission to accomplish in this world. But is it, is it easy to become that person that we have the potential to be? It's not easy at all. It's not because we have in our seed the potential to become a certain person that it's going to be easy. It's not going to be easy because we're going to have to fight against our yetzer We're going to have to find the way to find the resources that we have inside of ourselves. Sometimes it's true that we grow a trunk. We grow ramifications. But we don't even know that we have the resources to have flowers and fruits. We don't even know that. And sometimes we limit ourselves in our lives because of, the, of those beliefs. I cannot ever imagine I can have some flowers. I cannot even imagine one day I can grow some fruits. So I'm not even going to try. But every year, there is one day in the calendar that HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided to give us as a gift. It is a gift to Bishvat because it's the day where we can decide to feel that potential flowing up inside ourselves. The first day when the sap goes up in the tree, it, and because Adam, Adam is also considered as a tree, okay, the etz um, asadeh, Okay, so because of that, we too can feel that potential flowing up inside of, our, of ourselves. And what is that potential? The realization of that potential is actually the fruits. So that's why we eat fruits on Tu Bishvat. We eat fruits because by biting inside of a fruit, Hashem is giving us the opportunity to take a taste, to taste who you can become. Wow! Can I become this sweet person? Can I become that juicy? Can I become so elaborated as a fruit? Can I really do that? Yes, you can do that. But you have to realize what, what you have inside. But this creates a desire, an appetite to become that fruit. To be shrat celebrates the rebirth. Right? The rebirth, because the first time that we were born, our mom gave birth to ourselves, right? She gave birth, birth to us. But in order for us to reach our potential, we actually have to learn how to give birth to ourselves. And for those of you who are mothers already, we know that giving birth goes along some pain, painful contractions. Those who are not married and not mom, don't listen to that part. 
because now it's wonderful. We don't have any suffering during uh, giving birth. <laughs> okay, but even if it's painful, this is how Akadosh Baruch Hu helps us to press the tree in order for the sap to go up and to be the one we have the potential to be. Tonight, we have the honor to welcome a very inspiring woman who became that fruit that she is today through a very painful rebirth here in Miami a few years ago. Her journey to inspire and to elevate the flame within each and every one of us is very special and I can't wait to hear it. So please welcome tonight, Mrs. Charlene oh, Amina. Thank you for everything. Do you want me to help you with this? Sure. Wherever you see fit. Yeah. Thank you so much. Amazing. Is this, does this work or no? Yeah? Okay, amazing. I don't even know what to say after that. Esther, you're so bliai and hara. You're so beautiful and graceful inside and out. So thank you for that amazing uh, introduction. And also, fun fact, to be shvat is my husband Jonathan's Hebrew birthday, which is actually one of the reasons why we're here, to celebrate in his favorite city ever. So happy birthday, Jonathan. Ad mea ve'esrim with all the osher ve'kavod, gezunt parnasa nachat in the world. So tonight I'm actually going to be speaking about a topic that I was discussing with Adina when we spoke a couple of days ago. I was in my office. We got on a quick call to see how we can, what we can talk about that is relevant and tangible. Every single woman in this room is going through their own personal galut. Every one of us, myself included. Nobody here lives a perfect life. Hopefully, Bezrat Hashem, sometimes we can feel like everything is perfect, but Lemaisa, truthfully, everyone is going through Galut. It's because we have to feel that way until Mashiach comes. We can't have it all, so to speak, in this world, because this is not the world of Emet. This is the Alma de Shikra. It's a world of lies. It's a world of confusion. Bezrat Hashem, when Mashiach comes, everything will make sense. And there, life will be perfect. But what can we do to pull ourselves out of our personal galut as well as the galut that we're all experiencing collectively as a whole? So today's parsha was actually something so beautiful. If you're all part of, if any of you are part of my Nishmat army, by a show of hands, who is part of my Nishmat army? I love this. I love this. Okay, so we have, today was, Rachel, I know you are, for sure I know you are. So today we spoke, today is the actual day, Parshat B'Shalach, is when B'nai Israel said Az Yashir and Nishmat Kochai for the first time, as they were crossing through the Yamsuf. So I feel like this topic of discussion comes in very handy right now, because what can we do to get Hashem to split the Yamsuf for us? What is it? What's the special magic formula to go through our own Galut, to, go, to be redeemed from our Mitzrayim? So when you look at the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim, one common theme, common message throughout the, the entire topic of Yitziat Mitzrayim is Bizchut nashim tzidkaniot nigalu avotenu memitzrayim. It's because of the righteous women that Hashem freed us from slavery, that Hashem redeemed us from Egypt. Now when did this sentence, this mantra, this uh, women's march come about? It was at the time of the Korban Pesach. Hashem was shooting out all of the makot to the Mitzrim, and all of a sudden, what was it that merited us to get that beautiful top, that title of the Redeemers of Egypt? It was at the time of the Korban Pesach. The Korban Pesach was the men's job. They were the ones doing the physical labor. They were the ones putting in all the hard, arduous work, the sweat and the tears. It wasn't us. So why is it at that moment Hashem said, you, my daughters, you get to bring us out of Egypt. It's because of you. What did we really do? What was going on behind the scenes? On the front lines, the men were taking the Seh. The Seh was the god of the Mitzrayim. Taking the Seh, capturing it, 
bringing it home, tying it to a bedpost, having it shout and scream for four days, then they shechted it and slaughtered it, smearing its blood around our doorposts. How in the world did we get the title of the Redeemers at that point? Do you know what the women were doing at that time? Every woman that was witnessing the entire act of the Korban Pesach was panic-stricken. They were worried, they were freaking out as they say. Totally anxious, wanting to micromanage, wanting to tell their husbands, don't do that, that's so dangerous, they'll kill all of us if they see this. Do you realize what you're doing? You're capturing their God, you can't do that. Or we would be a slave to our fears and our worries and our anxieties. We'd panic, we'd doubt Hashem, we'd question the ways of Hashem. That's what our knee-jerk reaction was, to do all of that. But instead, what did the women do? The women right then said, Hashem, we don't understand, but we trust you. And with that trust, they went and they built tambourines to be able to serve Hashem through drums and tambourines while they're crossing the Yamsuf. We had such basic faith in the ways of Hashem without understanding it was choshech. It was mamash, literally darkness. It was dark figuratively and literally. We had no way of seeing how are we getting out of this. We're slaves. We are enslaved to the Egyptian Hashem. When is it going to end? Where? Where, where are they going to draw the line and free us? Right then when Hashem saw that the women in the midst of their panic and worry and anxiety and fears and their need to micromanage and the need to... Tell their husbands, you're doing it wrong. We stopped and we turned to Hashem and we said, Hashem, we don't understand your ways, but we trust you. And because we showed Hashem our trust, we rose above our nature. We rose above our knee-jerk reaction, our comfort zone. And with that rising above, going against our teva, we were able to convince Hashem to go against his and it was at that moment that Hashem said, nashim nigalu Does anybody know what the continuation of that Pasuk is? Ve'atidin lehigael. And it is because of you righteous women that you will be redeemed once again in the future. So friends, we know the formula. We did it once, it worked, and we were promised in the continuation of that Pasuk the atidin lehigael, and it will work again in the future. So right now, what we're all going to focus on is recognizing ways that we are stuck in our nature that's causing us to be slaves. It's holding us back from freedom. It's holding us back from geula. It's holding us back from having our own personal splitting of the yamsuf. We're all going to try so hard from now until Bezrat Hashem. Let's, let's make a deadline. I like deadlines. Because I don't want to say do it forever because it's too, uh, it's too commitment, commitment attached. We're not that great with commitments. But if I give everybody a deadline or like an end zone, this is the end goal, let's do it from now till Pesach. I'm not going to tell you how far away Pesach is because I don't want to cause panic. <laughs> but let's do it from now. How many days? What is it? You knew, you knew the amount? What is it? Okay, don't say. Don't say. We're going to get anxious. But from now until the first night of Pesach, when we actually sing Az Yashir and we talk about the Yam Suf, let's make a deadline. That's our deadline. From now until then, we all have homework, spiritual homework. What's our homework going to be? I'm going to give you guys a few examples and I'm going to share some personal stories of people in my life that rose above and went against their nature and they saw Yeshuot. I'm going to actually start with this amazing um, story about my mother. My mother was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma 12 years ago. She was diagnosed with lymphoma on the heels of Gali's drowning. My daughter Gali is Baruch Hashem, Chazdei Hashem. Today she's a beautiful 14-year-old spoiled brat. But if you, if you know anything about my story, you'll know that I became from as a result of my daughter Gali falling into the pool at my home right over here on 47th and Collins, the Green Diamond. I live there half the year. Gali fell into the pool while my nanny was watching her and she actually completely drowned. She didn't almost drown, she drowned. 
She was in cardiac arrest. Her neshama had left her body. Her body was blue. Her nails were purple. Her eyes wide open. And then Gali's hero daddy, who has been in Hatzalah for 31 years, resuscitated her while her panic-stricken and anxious, screaming, crying mommy promised Hashem to rise above my nature and to go against what I was doing, to put away my, pe- my, my bathing suits, to give away my clothes that were not snoot, stop wearing all my unsnoot clothing, and to finally, ultimately cover my hair. The moment I promised Hashem that I would cover my hair while my husband did CPR on her body, my hero husband found a tiny, faint pulse in Gali's two-year-old body. The rest is history. Eight hours later, the doctors came in and told us, we can't make sense of this, but she's alive and she's perfect. So if you've ever heard of the brand, the wig company called Gali's Couture Wigs, now you know why we started that. Because my Yeshua came from giving up my hair by rising above my nature, going against my comfort zone. My comfort zone was to leave my gorgeous blonde hair on display for the world. And my comfort zone was to wear bathing suits and tank tops and jeans and and all those great outfits. I rose above. And when I rose above, Hodul Hashem, Hashem split the Yamsu for me. But right after Gali's drowning, my mother was diagnosed with, with cancer. And that was a very, very dark period in my life. I was, already, I was already PTSD from my own incident. I was also postpartum because I had just given birth to my Aliza when Gali drowned. And my world turned very dark. When we got the call that my mom has cancer, it was the worst day of my life. My mom had a dream Friday night that she's a patient in a hospital and she's on a hospital bed about to undergo surgery. And in her dream, her father, who had died many, many years prior, opened the door of the, emergency, the operating room and he was wearing a mask. And he lowered her, his mask and he looked at my mother and he said in the dream, called out her name, check the left side of your body. Check the left side of your body. Check the left side of your body. My grandfather said this three times. We know that when a person passes away and goes to the to Alam Haba, they're not privileged to always come in a dream and give over messages. It's almost, it's very rare to have them come over and give a message from the other side. Many times you'll just see them in a dream and they're smiling or they're sitting far away or you'll be able to hug them but they don't really speak. And the reason for that is because in order for a person who's passed on to be able to come back to this world and give over a message, they need to give up a lot of their zechuyot. They need to go to Hashem and say, listen, I have to go and fulfill a mission back on earth, but I'm going to do it via dream. Can I pay for it with the following? And they wheel and deal, and if they're worthy, Hashem will agree. And then they can come over and give over a message. So my, my grandfather was, Allah va shalom, a humongous tzaddik. So he was able to give over this message. And my mother woke up Shabbat morning, terrified. She didn't know what was going on and she didn't know should she start to examine herself, but it was Shabbat. She didn't want to ruin the Oneg Shabbat. She decided she's gonna wait until Shabbat goes out. As soon as we did Havdalah, we were all at her house for Shabbat. We made Havdalah and my mom quietly ran upstairs to her bedroom. And as soon as she got upstairs, she began to do an exam. She couldn't find anything, she couldn't feel anything. And then she pushes her hair over her left side and she sees in the mirror something sticking out of the left side of her neck. Lo alechem, lo aleinu, lo adorenu. And right then my mother figured something was going on. She calls the doctor right away, the doctor's emergency line, says come first thing in the morning, Monday morning, we're gonna examine it. Monday morning my mother goes to the doctor, Right away, upon assessing this mass, the doctor knew right away it's not good. The doctor said it felt very suspicious, straight to a surgeon. My mom went from the doctor's office straight to the surgeon's office. The surgeon examines the lump, right away felt it doesn't feel good, and orders a biopsy. They did a biopsy, and the biopsy results were meant to come out in three to five days. Two weeks went by, and we had no results. And we were anxious, we were, couldn't breathe, we couldn't sleep, we couldn't eat. It was affecting every one of us. We were all just 
Every time the phone would ring, our knees would turn to jello and our hearts would race. What's going to be? So finally, it reached one point where we couldn't take it anymore. I called my siblings. I said, yalla, everybody get up. Let's go to mommy and daddy's house. We're gonna, I'm going to call the surgeon's office and I'm going to demand results today. Enough is enough. Ad Khan, up to here. I can't handle any more waiting. So we got everybody and we went to my parents' home. And my mother was besimcha. Of course, guys, what are you doing here? Go be with your husbands and kids. Everything's perfect. I'm fine. Chas shalom. It's not the C word. Don't even think that way. Think good, it'll be good. Of course they didn't call me yet. They forgot because it's fine. No news is good news. Every chizuk under the sun. My mom is throwing at us. Finally, the phone rang and my father races to the phone. We hear from the caller ID that it's the doctor's office. And we're strengthening ourselves. We're all standing in the kitchen. And my mom is next door. She's in the living room serving chai, tea, to her mother and her mother-in-law because they're panic-stricken and she's giving everyone chizuk. My, mother, my mother's in the next room, serving chai. We're all standing around the island in the kitchen. And my father runs into the room. And he answers the phone. And all we see is my father's shoulders from his back. And he's, yes. Yes, doctor. OK. What, what is it? What is it? Oh, I see. OK. And he begins to hang up. And we're looking at each other like, what is it? And my father turns around and he faces us. And he looks and he says, it's not good. Mommy has cancer. And we all threw ourselves on the floor of her kitchen and started screaming and sobbing and banging and throbbing and no, no, Hashem! I will never forget the way my mother's cold granite floor felt against my face. My world was ending. Right then, as my mother hears the commotion in her kitchen, she comes into the kitchen, looks at us with her hands on her hips and says, what on earth are you guys doing? Chas v'shalom that you should be complaining. We're Persian. And my mother says in Farsi, are you allowed to do nashokri? Are you allowed to complain to Hashem? Chas v'shalom. Absolutely not. Who's greater, Hashem or cancer? Guys, it's just cancer. Get up. Get off the floor. Hold my hands. Let's dance. Let's dance and say, thank you, Hashem. It's just cancer. And I thought to myself, Mommy, Mommy, are you okay? Mommy, did you hear what the doctor said? Mommy, it's not benign, it's malignant. I heard what the doctor said. I was on the other line. It's just cancer. If you complain, chas v'shalom Hashem will give you more reasons to complain. If you thank Hashem when you're in a dark place, Hashem will give you more reasons to thank Him. Right now, all of you get up and dance with me. She took her wailing, grieving, mourning children and husband off the floor. She picked us up and she caused us to dance around her island. If someone were looking on, they would think it's Simchat Torah and we're doing Hakafot. <laughs> nope. We were dancing because mommy had cancer. Two weeks later, we had her top, the appointment with the top oncologist team at Sloan and I'm sitting in the waiting room with my tears soaked and torn to Hillim, and I'm crying my eyes out and I don't, know how to, I don't know how to hold myself back. I'm just pouring out my neshama and I'm crying and I'm crying and the doors swing open and out walks my mom and my father with her team of doctors and she looks at all of us and she says, remember this, when you thank Hashem, when he puts a challenge in front of you, I promise you, you will have many, many more reasons to thank him. Don't ever complain. Don't ever do na shokri. Hashem is bigger than all of your problems. And with that, my mother instilled in all of us the greatest lesson we've ever been taught. Instead of joining us on the floor of her kitchen in misery and in tears and in grief, my mother rose above her nature. She wanted to cry. She wanted to complain. She wanted to say, Hashem, what? 
she rose above. And by her rising above, she pulled all of her children and her husband out of their Mitzrayim and hers. Hodul Hashem, she's Baruch Hashem, she's doing well. We're still waiting for the cure for cancer or Mashiach. Whichever comes first, we gladly accept. But Hodul Hashem, my mom is doing well. And now she has become the spokesperson for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It should be a defunct disease. It should no longer be in the world. But now anybody who's diagnosed, they come and they meet with my mother and she teaches them exactly what to do. And she gets them up and she makes them dance. She makes them dance just like she did with her children. And that is her method of operation. That is her, that is her medicine. Right. Every single one of us have our own Mitzrayim that we deal with. Whether it's Shalom Bayit problems, whether it's Parnassa issues, whether it's the Shidduch crisis, whether it's infertility. Infertility is something I've dealt very much with. For those of you who follow me, you know that I've had 11 miscarriages. I often joke and tell people, if Hashem tests the ones He loves, He's obsessed with me. <laughs> so in love. But the de Hashem, I am blessed with five of the brightest stars in Hashem's sky. Hashem blessed me with five children, all natural, all um, shocks to the, the, the science system. The doctors who looked at me and said I would never have a child of my own have my photo with my husband and five children hanging around me on my hospital bed, blown up on their doors of their office so that they could point to it and say God is an ultimate doctor. Anyone sitting in this room who's dealing with medical crises, chas v'shalom, you should not have. But anyone, anyone dealing with a personal Mitzrayim, a child that's not serving Hashem the right way, pregnancy issues, shidduch issues, mental health issues, whatever it is, we have the recipe to get ourselves to Geula. The atidin lihigael. Go against. Rise above and go against. That's it. And we can all practice it in ways that pertain to our lives. If your nature is to be a complainer, to do na shokri, to kvetch, to question, then from now till Pesach, the first night of Pesach, from now till the first Seder, every single day, once a day, you're going to rise above your nature. If your child is standing in front of you and Throw, you're warning the child, don't, throw, don't, don't hold that like that. It's going to spill, it's going to spill, it's going to break. Be careful. And that child all of a sudden throws your beautiful, expensive lalik bowl on the floor and it shatters into a thousand pieces. And your nature is to complain or to get angry. Right then, you're going to think to yourself, Hashem, I'm going to go against my nature. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to do it permanently. It's until the first night of Pesach. Let's make it a little bit, we could, we could make it for as long as you want, but let's at least try till then. And you're going to look to Hashem and you're going to say, Hashem, that might not be enough to get me a full redemption, but accept it as my down payment. At the time of Mitzrayim, when we said, Hashem, we're going to go build our tambourines, Hashem said, it's not enough, but I'll take it as your down payment. And we continued to give our down payments until Na'asev and Ishma. At that point, Hashem said, okay, these are all down payments. But we're all waiting for the ultimate Geula. So every single time you go against your nature from now till Pesach, turn to Hashem, pat yourself on the back, and turn to Hashem and say, Hashem, take that as my down payment. If your nature is not to daven, from now till Pesach, you're going to daven however you can. Whether it's a Shachrit a day, a Shema Yisrael a night, a Mincha an afternoon, or a Nishmat Kol Chai a day, whatever it is, to heal him, a parak here, a parak there, you are going to focus on the area you lack. You're going to focus on the area you struggle. You're going to focus on your nature, your comfort zone. And you're going to dive in. And the second you close your tehillim or your sitter and you kiss it, turn to Hashem and say, Hashem, that was my down payment. And you're going to do it bizchut and name whatever Yeshua or Geula you need. If your nature is to get angry, this is a hard one, because if people are struggling with anger, it's very, very hard to contain it. If your nature is to get angry from now till Pesach, you're going to rise above your nature. And the moment you feel like having a major outburst, whether it's on your child, your husband, your housekeeper, a friend, a coworker, whoever, 
anyone in your path that you feel like you need to shout or yell or take out your wrath on, you're going to stop, you're going to think of my mother, and you're going to think if she could go against her nature and rise above and get us to dance the moment she was diagnosed, you can hold your tongue and hold back. And you're going to say, instead of yelling and cursing and throwing, you're going to take, take a deep breath, and you're going to count to 10, and you're going to look at that incident and say, Hashem, that's my down payment. No response. If your nature is to speak Lashon Hara, from now till Pesach, the moment you're about to spill that juicy gossip, hold yourself back and say, Hashem, I'm going to zip it, and you are going to bless me with X, Y, and Z because this is my down payment. As long as the second night of Pesach, you don't tell everybody all those things you held back for the past 60 days. <laughs> we actually, we had an incident with um, our, my family. We do, in my home, we have Shmirat HaLashon hours. Every, every person takes on three hours a day of no speaking Lashon Hara so that we can conclude the entire 24-hour period with nobody speaking Lashon Hara. So it's beautiful. So the first week that we did this, I took upon myself the hardest hours. I took upon myself 9 p.m. till midnight because that's when I'm catching up with everybody. I'm on the phone, you know? This is going back already 14, 15 years ago. So, of course, 9.01, I would hear or find out the juiciest Lashon Hara in the world. And I would pick up my phone about to call people, my mom, my sister, my best friend. And I call, like, yeah, what's up? I'm like, oh, shoot. Um, call me in three hours. <laughs> And then you know what, Baruch Hashem, a lot of the times when they would call back or I would remember, you wouldn't feel the need to say it. Sometimes I wasn't so strong, but other times I was able to hold back. Everyone has that nature that we can hold back against. If your nature is to be grumpy from now till Pesach, you're going to fake it till you make it. You're going to be the Simcha. Once a day, you're going to put on a song and you're going to dance to Hashem, just because. It's so liberating. You have no idea. If you're in a bad mood, the best thing to do is to put on music and to dance. There's something to it. That's, in fact, Yosef HaTzadik. Yosef HaTzadik was known as Ish Matzliach. He was the most successful Matzliach man in all of Tanakh. What did he do? It says Yosef HaTzadik, every time, I see women nodding in the back, they probably know the story. Every single time Yosef HaTzadik was faced with a challenge, especially with Potiphar's wife, and he resisted, he would dance. He would dance like, yes, Hashem, I did it. I did it, I danced. He would dance and dance, and that would get him out of his funk, the bad mood that he could have fallen into because of all the pressures and all the tension, and that dancing created more mazal for him. So if you're in a funk, if you're in a bad mood, you're gonna dance from now till Pesach, and you're gonna see so much more bracha comes to you. Now I'm gonna conclude with a story from my brother-in-law. Now, this is kind of hot off the press. It's a new-ish story in my life. I've only said it about once or twice before. But it's a story of truly going against nature and just by witnessing that even in the darkest times when we think Hashem is chas v'shalom out to get us, we think we're really slaves, we think we're in Choshech Mitzrayim, we think the world is a dark, horrible place. When you trust Hashem and you go against your nature, Hashem will show you your Geula, your personal Yeshuot and Geula. We had a challenging year last year. It was a year that um, we really became a lot closer to Hashem, and not through Simcha, through, through pain. We had the year start off with losing my father-in-law. It was actually last Ju June, July. We were here in Miami when the Surfside building collapsed. So we, my husband being as part of Hatzalah, got called to go be at the triage by the Surfside building by Champlain Towers. But at the exact same moment, he got a call from New York that his father has gotten very, very ill and very frail. So he didn't know where to go. We asked a Rav. The Rav said, Kibbut Ava M always comes first. So my husband hopped on a plane and headed right back to New York. We had just arrived in Florida. We were going to be here for the whole summer, eight weeks. And as soon as my husband landed in New York, he called me and he said, don't unpack doesn't look good. We lost my father-in-law a few days later. But Baruch Hashem, we were zochet to make it back in New York in time. 
We got to go by his bedside, fall by his feet one last time, kiss his hand, say our tefillot by him, beg him for bringing us more bracha. And on Shabbat, the Shabbat after the Champlain Towers collapsed, my father-in-law took his last breath. We sat, they sat Shiva in my home back in New York. And my husband comes from a very small family. It's just him and his brother David, his younger brother David. And David is younger by seven years. I was, we had Shiva in the home, we had all the minyanim in our house, we brought our Sefer Torah back from our shul, and we had round-the-clock minyanim, round-the-clock food. It was exhausting and it was very sad, but it was also so beautiful to see when Klal Yisrael comes together. It's such a, it's, it's a real Mika Amcha Yisrael moment when you see people from all over the world flying in to pay a Shiva call. And in the midst of this Shiva, I started to notice that my brother-in-law David, the younger brother, was taking it exceptionally hard. And I kept thinking, Misken, you know, he's the younger brother. He was very close to his father. They both were very, very close to his parents. And he just must be taking it a very, very hard way. So I kept saying to Jonathan, Jonathan, David looks so ill. He looks so frail. He looks not well. Let's, what should we do for him? He said, no, he's just, he's more sensitive than I am. He's more emotional than I am. He's just taking it a little bit harder than I am. But every time I would bring them food, you know, they're in Avelim, so they can't, they're, the Avelim can't serve themselves food. So I would bring everybody food and I would serve it to them. And I would see my mother-in-law would take, my husband would take, but David would push the plate away. And I kept saying, David, eat something. You've lost so much weight. Eat something. He said, I can't. I can't. I have no appetite. I don't know what it is. And slowly, slowly throughout the Shiva, he lost more and more weight. And at the tail end, I noticed his skin was beginning to turn yellow. And I got very worried. So I called my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law into the room and I said, guys, I'm worried about David. Something's going on with him and I think it's a little beyond just the standard morning and shiva. So my sister-in-law came and said, you know what? He doesn't eat anything at home. I don't know what to do. He's very down. He's very weak. He's very sleepy. I don't know what's going on with him. So we called some doctors, Baruch Hashem, we got him an appointment the day after Shiva to go to the doctor. Now this is already right around the time of, we were approaching Elul, it was, in the, it was in the month of Elul. And David went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, we need to order a few MRIs and CAT scans, let's see what's going on. They had an MRI scheduled and the results came back that they found a massive tumor on his liver. And I remember thinking, Hashem, this is too much for this child. This is too much for this family. They just lost their father. It's been a very rough year. So many things. So we, I'll, I'll go deeply into more of what we went through on that year. A lot was going on. And David especially cannot handle these things. I said, Hashem, I beg you, I beg you, make the results turn back to be fine because we cannot handle another tragedy. We cannot handle another time-consuming, exhausting pain right now. But we, we saw the doctors were very, very serious. They said he needs to be admitted right away. They admitted David. By the time this whole thing unfolds, it's already three, four weeks. We're now approaching Rosh Hashanah. And David has this tumor on his liver. We know nothing about it. But he's in the hospital, admitted in the ICU. And it's one more round of COVID. So everything, everybody's, you know, one, only one, two visitors per day. The COVID units are all filled. And my husband, as a head of Great Neck Hatzala, only him and my sister-in-law were allowed to go visit him. What was my role throughout this? I was supposed to be the cheerleader. I'm the chizuk giver of the family. I'm the emuna builder. I'm the positive person. So every single day, my job was to FaceTime David while he's in the hospital and give him chizuk and to tell him, David, everything is going to be okay. Be besimcha. Stay positive, think good, it'll be good. And every single time he would say, could you just stop with the nonsense? Enough is enough. What's going on with my life? Why am I going through all these things? Where is Hashem right now? Where is Hashem? And I would say, Chas v'shalom. David, don't say that. Just say thank you. Just for once, just say thank you. I'm not thanking Hashem. I can't thank Hashem. I, I, I couldn't blame him. So every day I would FaceTime him. And I would read another story from the Daily Chizuk. He was admitted for a while. And finally, it was the day before Rosh Hashanah, and he was devastated. He said, how am I going to thank Hashem? I'm spending Rosh Hashanah in the hospital, 
this is where Hashem wants me to experience my Yom Hadin. And I explained, I said, David, you are exactly where you're supposed to be. And Hashem is the author of your pain. He knows that you're going to accomplish the highest levels in the ICU unit at North Shore Hospital instead of in the shul or at your home. Just please, one thank you to Hashem. Absolutely not. I'm not thanking Hashem. And he hung up. Aserati made teshuva. He was still in the hospital. Finally, Baruch Hashem, we get a phone call. One day, it was, um, it was the Sunday between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We get the phone call, Mr. and Mrs. Amanov. We have the results of David Amanov here. You're very, very lucky. Thank God, the tumor is benign. So we started singing, thank you, Hashem. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I said, have you told David yet? They said, no, we're on our way now. So I said, let me call him. So we call David, and David's on FaceTime once again. I said, David, how are you feeling? How do you expect me to feel? It's the worst day ever. I'm starving. The food is disgusting. I can't take anything. I hate it here. I want to come home. What's happening with my life? I said, David, hold on one second. His, his wife was calling me on the other line. She got the news too. I said, Alana, mazal tov on the good news. I said, okay, Shah, I have a crazy situation going on right now. David's in a really, really bad mood. I want to go tell him in person what the news is with the doctors. But my daughters have an appointment at DeFranco Spaniolo Salon on Middle Neck Road to get their haircuts. I don't know what to do. I was like, I get it. Like, I'm a girl. I know. Haircuts are important. You get the head stylist at DeFranco. You never say no. You get whatever time slot they're going to give you. I said, okay, so do you want me to take your girls for haircuts? She's like, um, maybe. Hold on. Oh, he's calling me again. You know what? No, forget it. I'm just going to cancel their appointments. It was September 13th. I'm just going to cancel their appointments. Let me take food to David. He's going to shecht all the nurses. And let me give him the good news that he does not have cancer. I said, good, you go, bring your girls to me, I'll take care of them. So my sister-in-law, Alana, brings over Rachel and Louis to my house. And they're hanging out in my kitchen, we're eating, we're feasting, we're having the best time. And all of a sudden, my husband's phone and walkie-talkie and the house phone start ringing and buzzing and beeping. And they call, H-Base to Q100, H-Base to Q100. And my husband picks up the phone and they say, yes. MCI incident on Middle Neck Road. We need all hands on deck. Dispatch all the buses, all the units. We need Queens, we need Farakwe, we need Five Towns. Everybody come to Great Neck. MCI incident on Middle Neck Road. So my husband grabs all of his stuff and he's calling all the guys, dispatching them all to the scene and they leave. And I have Rachel and Lily, my nieces, sitting in, my, in front of me, having food. We're having a wonderful time. My husband is out saving the world. All of a sudden, my husband calls me and he says, look at your phone right now. And he sends me videos and pictures. You guys can actually Google it right now and you'll see or Google it afterwards and you'll see what I'm talking about. DeFranco Spaniolo Salon is on Middle Neck Road. A woman driving a massive expedition had a seizure while driving and the car 92 miles per hour smashed into DeFranco Salon. The first two seats in front of the windows at DeFranco were empty. That's where the children get their haircuts. I called David, my whole body is goosebumps as I'm thinking about this. I called my brother-in-law David with Alana by his side. I said, David, Alana, do you guys want to know why this whole nightmare unfolded? David, do you want to know why Hashem did all of this to you? You're, you're sitting there feeling sorry for yourself. You're sitting there doubting Hashem. You're feeling like Hashem is out to get you. You're cursed. You have bad mazal. Yeah? Right now, before I tell you what I'm about to tell you, now say thank you, Hashem, because you just heard that you don't have liver cancer. Now say thank you, Hashem. Okay. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. I said, now one more time, I want you to thank Hashem for something else. Say, thank you, Hashem, it wasn't my children. He said, what? I said, say it. Thank you, Hashem, it wasn't my children. Shar, what are you talking about? I said, check your WhatsApp right now. I'm forwarding videos to you from Jonathan right now. So he's looking at his WhatsApp, and I forward all the videos that Jonathan is sending me. It was a mass casualty incident. There was blood all across 
the entire floor area of DeFranco, all over Loa Lenu. We should never know such a scene. It looked like a bloodbath. You know who wasn't at DeFranco Salon? Rachel and Lily Amanoff. Because Hashem in his infinite wisdom knew that he should give David such a harsh and difficult galut, very temporarily, because had David not been in the hospital, had he not had those horrible experiences and all that drama and those terrible nurses and the worst food and the horrible jello and all that, his daughters would not be here. So, ladies, every single time something happens in our lives, it is Litova. It is for your own good. How and when we are privileged to see that? Up to Hashem. What's our job? Our job is not to understand the ways of Hashem. Our job is to trust the ways of Hashem. And that's it. If we can get ourselves to say thank you when it is so dark outside, Hashem will dispel the darkness with so much light. If we can get ourselves to rise above and to dance in the face of fear and tragedy, lo aleinu, Hashem will give us reasons to dance. If we can force ourselves to dance at the time of pain, or to sing shira to Hashem when we're sad, or to hold back our tongue when we want to say lashon hara, or to say thank you when we want to complain, or to give a hug instead of a patch, we have just fulfilled the formula of the Atidin Lehigael. We have just tapped into the secret of how to yank ourselves out of Galut. We're all in this together. And I can promise you that Mashiach is right around the corner. It's a really long corner, but it's a, he's right around the corner. And all we need to do is to get ourselves to rise above. And the next time you are faced with anything, anything that looks dark, anything that doesn't make sense, anything that causes you fear, anything that causes you panic, anything that makes you want to cry or clutch or complain or shout. Think of me. Rise above, go against your nature, do exactly what we discussed, and then turn to Hashem and say, that, that's my down payment, Hashem. Now please bless me with, and right then you have created an eight ratzon for yourself. Dive in your heart out. Dive in for any person in your life, Daven for yourself, daven for those who you know need Yeshua, daven for whatever it is you need. And Bezrat Hashem, Hashem should bless you with it. Beruchniut and Begashmiut, Beolam Hazeh and Beolam Abba on a silver platter. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. It should be a Shavua Tov. You should all have all of the brachot you want and you need from life without having to endure the darkness that comes beforehand. Thank you so much for having me. Hi. Good, thank you.